Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to our program in honor of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, located in beautiful Wellwind Preserve in Glen Cove, New York. While our building is closed due to the COVID-19 crisis, we have shifted to online programming like this one to continue our mission to teach the history of the Holocaust and its lessons through education and community outreach. And let me at this point extend my own good wishes to all of you to stay healthy and safe during these strange times. Before I begin, I wanted to also mention two other points. First, I wanna encourage you to pose any questions you have using the chat function. Uh, you should be able to find the chat function by rolling your mouse over the bottom part of your screen. If you just type your chat questions in there and then I will respond to them either while I'm talking or at the end of the presentation. Uh, a second thing I wanted to mention at the outset is that I'm gonna be showing some graphic images during my talk. Um, and even though they were taken 75 years ago, they remain disturbing. And um, so I wanted to prepare you for that. Our program today is meant to mark the 75th anniversary this coming Wednesday on April 29th of the liberation of the concentration camp in Dachau. Before I start talking about Dachau, I wanna raise some broader points and talk about the liberation of Auschwitz as a way to give context to what the soldiers found in Dachau. To start with the broader topic, 2020 marks not only the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau, but also, of course, the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Various uh, events and commemorations are planned all over the country during the course of the year. Here in Nassau County, the various history organizations in the county got together and created a special seal that you see here to promote all the various programs that are taking place and suggesting the honor that we all hold for our veterans who fought during World War II. When Americans think of 1945 and the end of World War II, I don't think they often think of the liberation of Dachau. There are instead a couple of iconic images that often come to mind. The raising, oops, the raising of the U.S. flag on, um, on Mount Sarabachi in Iwo Jima in February of 1945 one of those iconic, iconic images. And it was later became the basis for the Marine Corps War Memorial dedicated in 1954 in Virginia. Less well-known perhaps was a similar flag raising photograph taken by the Red Army after they raised the Russian flag on the burned out remains of the Reichstag when they took Berlin on April 30th, 1945. And it became one of the iconic images of the war in the Soviet Union. And of course, perhaps the most famous image, the kiss from Times Square on VJ Day, August 14th, 1945. As these photos suggest, the end of the war um, came not just on a single moment, but uh, was spread out over time. Even if you just look at the war in Europe, where I would like to focus my talk, the end of the war came not as a single moment, but as a rolling event that followed the Allied forces as they retook control. Formally, the war ended in Europe on VE Day, uh, May 8, 1945, when Germany gave its unconditional surrender. But towns in Italy saw the war end in 1943, and in France after D-Day in June of 1944. The wave of liberation sometimes rushed forward and sometimes came to a standstill or even ebbed backward, but gradually washed over Nazi-controlled Europe from west, east, and south. The chief of staff of the U.S. Army issued a series of, map, of maps that depict that wave of liberation. Here's the map from July 1st, 1943, with the Soviet Red Army fighting in the east, but before any U.S. forces had landed in Europe. Four months later, in November, the map shows the Allied forces had landed in Italy. And by July of 1944, progress in Italy had slowed, but the Red Army had won big gains and Allied forces had made it into France after the D-Day landing in Normandy one month earlier. Three months after that, 
In September of 1944, the D-Day landing was gaining ground and there was a new push coming up from Marseille. By December of 1944, the D-Day landing was, uh, sorry, the five months after the D-Day landing, France was almost entirely free, as were Brussels and Luxembourg, and the Red Army had moved into Eastern Poland and much of South and Eastern Europe. Finally, by May of 1945, less than a year after D-Day, Germany surrenders. It's one thing, of course, to see the rising tide of Allied forces on a map, but we need, of course, to remember that this was hard fighting. During the Battle of the Bulge in January of 1945, which had some of the hardest fighting, Americans suffered 90,000 90, casualties, and 19,000 soldiers were killed. Overall, in the 11 months between June of 1944 and May of 1945, American forces in Europe suffered 552,000 casualties, with 104,000 soldiers killed in action. American allies also suffered casualties, none more than the Soviet Union. Over the course of the war, the 15 countries of the Soviet Union combined to face more than 8 million military deaths and a further 16 million civilian deaths from war and famine. These massive casualties stoked a rage in the Red Army that would be particularly vented on Germans as the Red Army moved westward. These soldiers, American and other Allied forces, paid the ultimate price for the freedom that was celebrated in their wake. But the Allied forces did not only confront enemy forces and cheering civilians, they also confronted the Nazi genocide. While soldiers in all wars have faced the gruesome aftermath of battles with wounded and dying combatants, in World War II, as the Allies moved towards Germany from both West and East, they faced something not seen before, the concentration camps and death camps of Nazi Germany. Today, most Americans have some sense about the horrors that took place in those camps. There are museums like my own in Glen Cove, or the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C., or Yad Vashem in Israel, and dozens of others that educate visitors about the Holocaust. There are also video testimonies, uh, books, um, in-person presentations, uh, not to mention uh, bookcases full of works by scholars. Countless movies have also added information about the Holocaust to the general knowledge. And there are memorials at the sites of many of the camps that enable visitors to see firsthand what took place in them. But in 1944, despite efforts by Polish resistance fighters to get word out about Nazi atrocities, most Allied soldiers had no idea that the Nazis had implemented a plan to murder all the Jews of Europe. It was the Red Army that discovered the first Nazi death camp when they arrived at Madonik near the Polish town of Lublin, where around 80,000 Jews had been murdered and burned in crematoria. Soviet soldiers, although familiar with Nazi mass shootings, found evidence of a completely different scale of murder than they'd seen before. But they found even more evidence of Nazi barbarism six months later, after pushing the Germans out of Krakow and discovering the camp at Auschwitz, where a million Jews were killed, mostly through gassing, and burned in a series of industrial crematoria. 10 days before the Red Army arrived at Auschwitz, SS guards had forced most of the remaining prisoners who were still alive, some 56,000 inmates, on a westward march toward Germany. They also blew up the crematoria and the two remaining gas chambers and set fire to warehouses of looted property, all in an effort to hide evidence of what they had been doing. On January 27, 1945, the soldiers from the Red Army arrived at the Polish town of Oświęcim, that the Germans called Auschwitz, and then found the camp outside the town, where 7,000 prisoners who had been left there because they were too weak to leave remained on site. They'd been left with no food, no water, and no medical care, left to die. <coughs> Vasily Petrenko, then a colonel in the 107th Infantry Division of the Red Army that liberated Auschwitz, later commented on what he remembered. I had seen a lot of terrible scenes while fighting on the front lines, he said. I saw my comrades dying. I saw signs of German atrocities in the territories 
we freed, dozens of people hanged by the Germans, women and children shot to death. What I saw in the camp was beyond any comparison. I saw 82 children from three to 14 years old racked by criminal medical experiments. I saw women and ch children who resembled skeletons, who couldn't even smile in a human manner. They had tears in their eyes, but they couldn't even sob. As soon as they arrived, the liberating forces assisted by the Polish Red Cross tried to help survivors. The Red Army also quickly sent in investigators and war correspondents to document the scope of Nazi atrocities at Auschwitz and to prepare the first news materials for the press. Photographs were taken of the area. Buildings were searched for evidence about the crimes committed. Documents were gathered for future trials. Even video film footage was taken, or not video, film footage. On May 7, 1945, the Soviet Extraordinary State Commission published findings from their investigations in the Soviet daily Pravda in a communique entitled On the Heinous Crimes Committed by the German Government in Auschwitz. The communique included a description of the camp and its buildings, the process of mass extermination in the gas chambers, and the experiments that had been conducted on prisoners. The Red Army's discovery of the death camps of Madonik, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Auschwitz in the summer of 1944 and winter of 1945 meant that the Americans and other allies should have been prepared for what they, should, what they were going to expect as they moved in from the West. But despite regular reports of the threat to European Jewry from as early as 1940, and despite the Roosevelt administration's announcements in March 1944 that the Nazis were undertaking, quote, wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe in what Roosevelt termed one of the blackest crimes of all history, Americans were reluctant to believe that the Holocaust was taking place. This lack of belief was partially due to anti-Semitic bias and thinking such reports were fabricated, but also based on an unwillingness to comprehend what previously had been unimaginable. The reluctance also stemmed from the memory of the aftermath of World War I, when atrocity stories that had come out during the war proved in the aftermath to be unfounded. Mary, many American leaders and members of the American public treated information about Nazi atrocities in a sim as similar exaggerations or falsehoods. This skepticism was shared by the press. Alexander Wirth was a correspondent for the Sunday Times in England who visited Madonic shortly after it was liberated. He saw firsthand the gas chambers, mass graves, and mounds of human remains. And yet when he submitted the story to the BBC, they refused to broadcast it, saying they thought it was a Russian propaganda stunt. The New York Herald was equally reluctant, claiming that even on top of all we've been taught of the maniacal Nazi ruthlessness, this example sounds inconceivable. It was only when the Western allies began to discover concentration camps that Americans' attitudes changed. The big shift for Americans came in April of 1945 when American troops first liberated Ordruf, one of the subcamps at Buchenwald. General Eisenhower, who visited the site on April 12th, just a week after it had been liberated, bringing Generals Omar Bradley and George Patton with him, later wrote, I have never felt able to describe my emotional reaction when I first came to face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. Up to that time, I had known about it only generally or through secondary sources. I'm certain, however, that I have never at any other time experienced an equal sense of shock. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp at Ordra because I felt it was my duty to be in a position from then on to testify firsthand about these things in case there ever grew up at home the belief or the assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. <clears throat> Eisenhower also ordered all nearby units who were not on frontline duty to visit the camps at Ordruf and Nordhausen. According to Eisenhower, even if the average GI didn't know who he was fighting for, he would now at least know what he was fighting against. Eisenhower also invited the world press to come and tour the camps. And newsreel footage from these visits finally reached American theaters on May 1st, 1945. 
shocking the nation to its core. Here's a short clip uh, of a graphic newsreel from April 26, 1945. of the Nazi scum. And General Eisenhower, a man hardened by the blood and shock of war, seems appalled at these unbelievable sights. Accompanied by General Bradley on his reported mission, and also by General Patton's hard-boiled yet visibly moved, the Supreme Commander sees demonstrations of the torture rack. Most camp officers fled before the advancing Allies, but some fell into our hands, and with townsfolk are forced to witness the devil's work of the men they should be ashamed to call countrymen. Anger at what the U.S. Army was discovering reached a peak on April 29th, just nine days before the end of the war in Europe. When the 42nd and 45th Divisions of the 7th Army fought their way through Munich into Dachau. Dachau was not an extermination camp. It was a concentration camp, indeed the first concentration camp, which had been opened in 1933. On the day of liberation, Dachau had 67,000 registered prisoners on its books. Uh, most of those were in the main camp, where 45,000 were categorized as political prisoners and 22,000 were categorized as Jews. As the American military drew near, German guards shot thousands and forced more than 10,000 prisoners, mostly Jews, to march south. When the Americans entered the camp, they liberated the 32,000 who had been left behind and were still alive. The men of the 45th Division had been through 511 days of combat before they arrived in Dachau. The first sight that these battle-hardened men saw at Dachau was worse than what they had seen on the battlefield. On a railway siding leading up towards the camp, the American soldiers came across a train carrying prisoners evacuated from the east and north. When they opened its boxcars, they found 2,300 prisoners on it, all of them dead. The train had left Buchenwald near Weimar on April 7th and was initially supposed to go to the concentration camp at Flossenburg, about 125 miles southeast of Weimar. In the end, the train went to Dachau, another 30, 135 miles further south from Flossenburg, but it took 23 days of winding around a bomb damaged track to get there. The directing and redirecting of the train with no care for the inmates inside, who were given little in the way of food or water, took place as German defeat was apparent. But Germans decided to spend their precious final military resources not on fighting, but on preventing these prisoners from being liberated. And by the time the train arrived in Dachau and was discovered by US soldiers, the only thing on the train were rotting, emaciated corpses. As they entered the camp, the U.S. soldiers found further scenes of horror, including piles of dead bodies. While Dachau had not been designed as a death camp like Sobibor or Treblinka, and was not built as a place to murder all the prisoners brought there, thousands were killed in Dachau by starvation, disease, and hard labor. The Nazi pra practice had been to cre cremate the bodies of any prisoners who were killed, but as Allied troops moved in from east and west, Thousands of prisoners from other camps were sent to Dachau and conditions deteriorated beyond the camp's ability to handle it. Statistics kept by the Germans show how things changed. More than a year before the liberation in January of 1944, 54 prisoners in Dachau were killed over the course of the month. The following month, February 1944, 101 prisoners were killed. But by early 1945, as Allied troops pushed forward on all fronts, the Nazis sent prisoners evacuated from more distant camps into Dachau and the death rates skyrocketed. In January of 1945, 2,888 prisoners were killed in Dachau, more than 50 times the number of the previous year. And in February, the figure was almost 4,000. 4,000 deaths 
in one month in a camp that had been designed as a prison and forced labor camp. By April, when the American troops arrived, there, were no, there was no more coal left to stoke the crematoria and bodies had been lying on the ground, their clothing often removed to be given to other prisoners who were still alive. Many of the American soldiers, when they were interviewed, described the scene with the same analogy, bodies stacked like cordwood. There is film footage online available that captures the events at Dachau on the day of liberation, but in all honesty, I found it too graphic to show. And truly, none of the photographs or video footage capture the horror that the GIs experienced. One thing that many soldiers recalled was the stench that could be smelled from well outside the camp. Russell Weiskircher, a battalion commander, was among the American troops that liberated Dachau. Despite Eisenhower's efforts to publicize what troops had found at Ordruf and Nordhausen, Weiskircher later recalled, we didn't know about a concentration camp and nobody believed anybody could be that inhumane. We got to the town of Dachau. It was a little old Bohemian artist colony. Nobody said they knew anything about a war. It was all Hitler's fault. You know the story. Until we met an old guy who pointed to his nose and told us to follow it. We went about two kilometers following our nose and the smell was indescribable. How did the soldiers respond to what they found? Many wrote letters back to family members to try and process what they were seeing. And as I'll talk about more in a moment, soldiers went from fighters to caregivers as they tried to help the survivors. But American soldiers also got angry, angry at the Nazis who treated human beings so viciously, including American soldiers who were POWs in Dachau. Various stories came out after the war that American soldiers engaged in reprisals at Dachau, killing SS guards who were captured when the camp was liberated. There was an official investigation conducted by the 7th Army's Assistant Inspector General, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Whitaker, which resulted in the publication of a formal report on June 8, 1945, entitled Investigation of Alleged Mistreatments of German Guards at Dachau. The IG report concluded, this investigation indicates an apparent lack of comprehension on the part of the investigating officer of the normal disorganization of small unit combat actions and of the unbalancing effects of the horrors and shock of Dachau on combat troops already fatigued with more than 30 days continuous combat action. In the opinion of the undersigned, the investigation indicates further an apparent attempt to accentuate testimony unfavorable to the participants rather than to develop the investigation impartially. Further investigation led the US military to consider court marshals for a few of those involved, including the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks. However, General George Patton dismissed the charges. Colonel Charles Decker, an acting deputy judge advocate, concluded in late 1945 that while there had probably been a violation of international law, in the light of the conditions which greeted the eyes of the first combat troops, troops, it's not believed that justice or equity demand that the difficult and perhaps impossible task of fixing individual responsibility now be undertaken. In short, it was impossible to blame American combat soldiers who'd fought their way into Germany from continuing to act as combat soldiers once they arrived in a place like Dachau. And the conditions which greeted the eyes, as they said in the report, were so horrific that it was hard to blame soldiers for any actions they took in the heat of the moment. Perhaps more surprising is the degree to which the liberating forces kept control of their emotions and quickly shifted from a fighting force to one that sought to give care and aid to Nazi victims. In the immediate wake of Dachau's liberation, the US 7th Army took over the administration of the camp. On April 30th, the day after the American soldiers had entered Dachau, the military established Displaced Persons Team Number 115, made up of Army doctors and other military personnel, to take care of the prisoners. On the same day, truckloads of food and medical supplies were brought by the US military to the camp. 
Two days later, on May 2nd, the 116th Evacuation Hospital arrived, followed by the 127th Evacuation Hospital, establishing full medical services for the liberated prisoners. The U.S. Army also took on the task of burying the thousands of dead that lay around the grounds of the camp in various states of decomposition. They had to bring in an engineering unit to dig huge trenches with bulldozers to serve as mass graves. When the American command turned to review the files that the Germans, with characteristic meticulousness, had maintained, they found the full record of pseudo-medical experiments that had been done there. Prisoners had been used as laboratory animals. Hannah Arendt suggested that the camp was itself a vast laboratory in which the Nazis proved that there is no limit to human depravity. Most frightening, the experiments were not planned or conducted by psychopaths, but by professional scientists trained in what had once been considered the greatest universities and medical schools in the world. Strangely, Dachau, while the longest serving concentration camp, operated on a significantly smaller scale than Auschwitz, and yet may have been the more horrific camp to liberate. Although the horrors at uh, Dachau, as well as Ordruf and Nordhausen, were seared into the minds of US soldiers, confirming the inhumanity of the Nazis and leading both to physical illness and revulsion, even to the point of sparking reprisals, Dachau was not a death camp. Dachau had opened in 1933, as I mentioned, as a place to intern political prisoners who voiced opposition to the Nazi regime. Its purpose was enlarged to include forced labor and eventually the, eventually the imprisonment of Jews, German and Austrian criminals, and foreign nationals from countries that Germany occupied and invaded. Overall, around 200,000 people were interred for some time in Dachau between 1933 and 1945, and somewhere around 30,000 prisoners were murdered, most from disease and hard labor or of starvation. Auschwitz, on the other hand, opened in 1940, seven years later, and was a hybrid camp. It was both a work and prison camp like Dachau, but also a death camp. Approximately 1.3 or 1.4 million people were deported to Auschwitz between 1940 and 1945. Around 400,000 were registered as prisoners during that time and forced to work for some time before most succumbed to the conditions or were killed by the guards. In total, 1.1 million people were murdered at Auschwitz, the great majority of whom were taken directly upon arrival to gas chambers where they were killed. But when you look at the number of prisoners who were present when the liberators arrived, then you see a stark contrast. Only 7,000 inmates were still around in Auschwitz compared to 32,000 at Dachau. Despite the far larger scale of murder at Auschwitz, the liberating forces in Dachau freed almost five times as many inmates as the Red Army did at Auschwitz. The flow of the war, of course, had an impact on the experience of the liberating forces. The Russians came upon Auschwitz after the Germans had, had had time to destroy the gas chambers, burn evidence, and force most of the prisoners to leave. The Nazis had stopped using the gas chambers three months earlier, so there had been time to dispose of the bodies, leaving only ash. The situation in Dachau was very different. While the Nazis evacuated most of the prisoners, they had not had time to destroy evidence. And most crucially, Dachau had been overwhelmed by the scale of killing in the preceding months, and so the gruesome remains of murder were all around. Indeed, because Dachau was not a death camp, not designed to murder and burn thousands of bodies each day, it was unable to manage the rising number of deaths taking place there as the war drew to a close. So when the Russian army arrived at Auschwitz, although they found a massive camp, it took investigating to understand what had been taking place there. On the other hand, even as the American soldiers approached Dachau, they could see and smell the evidence of mass murder. However, for both Russian and US soldiers, the experience of liberating the camps reinforced their own sense of why they were fighting. Leonard Pinky Popich, an American in the 45th Infantry, Infantry Division that liberated Dachau, described this feeling. 
Many times, he wrote to his family, since I have come overseas while miserable in a wet foxhole or sweating out a Jerry artillery barrage or lying out in rain pinned down by enemy small arms fire, I have asked myself what it is all about. Why am I here? Why, why, why? He went on to describe what he had seen at Dachau and then concluded, I saw firsthand the things that I have heard about and which I had never quite believed. Now I know what this war is all about. Now I know why we are fighting. To me, all the suffering and misery I've had to put up with these past eight months has been well worthwhile. Just to see the joy on the faces of these tortured, suffering people repaid all of us that saw a thousandfold. I'm proud to be one of the many who finally helped free those poor souls who have been through a hell that the decent mind cannot imagine possible here on God's own earth. That perhaps is the final irony. It was the horror of the liberated concentration camps that gave soldiers the meaning for the war. Today, just a few days shy of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau, we honor the heroic deeds of the American soldiers and memorialize the victims of Nazi atrocities. The number of veterans from the 42nd and 45th Division who are still with us to recall those events that they witnessed firsthand is now small. I had the particular pleasure of corresponding with one of them, Staff Sergeant Dan Daugherty of the 45th Infantry Division recently as I prepared for this talk. His accounts, along with many by his fellow soldiers from that day, are widely available in books, articles, and documentaries. It falls now to us and future generations to remember their deeds and to remember what they fought to protect. I'm gonna stop there. If you have questions, I hope that you will put them into the chat window. I hope you found this presentation interesting. I wanted to invite you to join me for some of our other upcoming virtual programs, including this coming Wednesday, when I'll be talking about the Lodge Ghetto by focusing on one person's working papers that we have in our gallery. Uh, next Sunday, Professor Elisa Solomon from Columbia University will be presenting a program on the abiding power of Fiddler on the Roof. And you can find a full list of our programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org. And I hope you will consider making a donation to support programs like this by clicking on the Give Now button on the top right corner of our website, again at www.hmtcli.org. We, we of course rely on your donations to keep our programs going, particularly at these difficult times. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me for this talk, and I look forward to seeing you at other programs soon. Have a good afternoon.